Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special briefing. I'm Eli Klubstein, JPC's Content and Media Director. The current war against Hamas, following its horrific attack on southern Israel on October 7th, introduces, introduces a new concept, a new feature of modern warfare, the first four-dimensional war. This war unfolds across four realms, land, sea, air, and also cyberspace. In an attempt to understand this new dimension, we will explore the, dyna the dynamics of the ongoing di digital warfare, its impact on the Israeli population, and the management of external wartime engagement. This is actually only part of what we will discuss today, and for this, we have brought a special expert, dear to us at JPC, who has been re researching this topic for many years, Dr. Tila Shvat al Shulil, law and technology expert at the Israeli Democracy Institute and our own advisory board member. Hi, Tila. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So maybe you can start by presenting the idea. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all. Um, I want to uh, start by sharing a couple of, uh, of screens with you. I decided not to create slides, but rather show you um, fresh and actual links. I thought it would make a better... Uh, uh, impression. So let's start with that. Um, you've all seen the little video um, that was sent by Hamas with the hostages hostages uh, um, um, uh, blaming Netanyahu for not releasing them and for his responsibility um, for all that happened uh, uh, during uh, uh, the war. I thought that would be a, a good start to talk about the depth of the additional uh, dimension of the warfare, um, like the, the digital uh, dimension. Um, uh, the rhetorics that she, again, I guess, was forced uh, uh, to use is meant for a purpose, to my opinion, uh, to continue and, and deepen the uh, fracture that have splintered Israeli society up until the war has uh, uh, begun. And um, if we want to uh, uh, move on just a little bit, um, one of um, um, of Netanyahu's uh, biggest supporters on Twitter, Meni Asayag, uh, obviously fell into this trap or directly into this trap. He he uh, wrote obviously in Hebrew, but let me translate it for you. I watched this video. I will not publish it here. But I was wondering about the message that the speaker is uh, talking about. Obviously, she sounds like one of the Kaplan uh, protesters. Um, and you should judge uh, for yourself. So he fell directly into this uh, uh, trap. By the way, this tweet was later uh, deleted. One of the, uh, I would say, well-known techniques of information warfare, writing something and then, um, and then deleting it. Um, so that, that's the first thing I wanted to start uh, talking about, but let me, um, offer a couple of more um, uh, a couple of more uh, uh, examples. Um, so let's start with um, this. Uh, this is the, like uh, the actual uh, Facebook page of a person called Talia Malach. She says she lives in Los Angeles, California. She's from Netanya. She's followed by uh, twenty six hundred. Uh, 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 people. She is the source of a video that was posted uh, three days ago. This is the video. I don't know if you've seen it before. Can you listen? Can you hear the, the music? Really? No, no, we can't. No, we can't hear it. You can you can hear the music? No. no. Okay, but can you see the video? Yes. Okay, so let me just, let's continue just a little bit with that. Okay, so the reason why I showed you this video is because um, it is Iranian. Um, we've checked this um, um, and we know uh, Talia Malach from... Uh, uh, from before. What is interesting here is that um, this um, uh, this video has met, um, a very few likes, but it has 65 shares. And if you look at the shares, you can actually, uh, can you see people who share this? Um, you can actually see that she 
uh, deliberately shares it on people's walls so that it would look like to the algorithm that it is very, very, um, uh, that is, it, it, that it's very, very uh, popular. Um, what do we know about this Talia Malach uh, uh, person? That would be uh, interesting uh, uh, to note. So we've known her before in, in a few names. She's using a few names. Um, she was one of the originators on um, uh, July 6, 2020. Uh, no, she, she opened up this um, her, her Twitter account on uh, uh, under the name Talia Efron, not Talia Malach, um, but she, uh, and she's using a stolen uh, a photo. How do we know her? We know her because she has used a photo um, that allegedly um, is claiming that protesters, again, the judicial overall, were burning a photo of uh, a very famous Zionist religious uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Rav Chaim uh, uh, Druckmann. And as you can see, um, there was this original video, but she has uh, uh, posted, do you see the, the, um, uh, the, the burning photo? She has posted uh, uh, this. And uh, the Shin Bet has already uh, uh, assured to us, confirmed to us that um, that was an Iranian, uh, 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 that was an Iranian, um, um, uh, uh, um, Profile. account, yeah. Uh, so that was an an an, an Iranian uh, account. Why do I tell you all this? Um, I tell you this because this video um, was also shared by another Twitter account. It is called the Dark Government. Okay, and um, uh, this is this is also a fake account. Um, and they've been using this video together with um, Michal, uh, what's her name, the other, uh, Talia um, Malachi. Uh, Malachi. So it's the same video. They've been posting it, posted it over and over and over. But when we looked at this, um, um, at this um, account, we could see uh, um, other pictures as well. Look at this one, for example. Can you see it? Send me the exact place of Iron Dome, and I will give you 200,000 shekels. That's a very nice offer, isn't it? I was thinking maybe I would do it myself. There's another one like that. Um, tell me exactly where the officers of the high officers' home addresses are, and I will give you 2,000. Uh, 200,000 shekels. Now, those are actual real links on Twitter. Nobody took them down, even though we have warned or repeatedly warned that those were fake and um, hostile account. But what's interesting about them is the fact that they are well interwoven into um, a regular Israeli, uh, a regular Israeli um, accounts. Um, another quick example that I wanted to share with you with you is another um, uh, is an account called Ella Le Levy. Ella Levy again um, says that she lives uh, she studied at UCLA and she lives in uh, uh, in the states um, and she is working as the manager of what we call Nivzake Arye Yehuda, which is the news of. Arya and Yehuda, which are like uh, biblical Hebrew uh, names. Ela Levi, again, is an Iranian um, uh, account. We've, uh, uh, we got it proven uh, a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of years ago. But what, what's interesting about it is that when you get into this Facebook group called Nivzake Arya Yehuda, let me show it to you, and it's all online on Facebook, so... That's why I wanted to to show it to you just like that. Um, those are the, this is the the account. You see that she is actually um, uh, managing a Facebook group. This is a far right wing Facebook group, and one of the more most active players in this group in terms of posting uh, content on it is a guy called Benny Hasno. Benny Hasno is. Um, one of uh, Itamar Ben Gvir's um, um, uh, party nominees for mayor of a town in southern Israel called Kiryat Malachi. Um, and he continues posting on those groups, both on Facebook and on 
um, uh, and on WhatsApp, even though I myself have warned have warned him that this is a an Iranian account. So and it has been proving by Israeli. Um, um, let me just. Okay, so and it has been proven by other um, by other uh, um, uh, Shin Bet uh, uh, officials. So what I was saying here is that um, until the the beginning of the twentieth century, thoughts about wars were you know a soldier against a soldier, a ship against a uh, ship, and then came World War Second World War where we started using aircrafts. And aircraft kind of changed the, uh, um, I would say, the spectrum of wars in the sense that it blurred the lines between the front of the the forefront of the of the battlefield and the uh, home front. Um, think about the Blitz on London. Israel has started, um, I would say, confronting this problem since the beginning of the nineties. Uh, the first Gulf War, and then after that, the Second Lebanon War, where it has developed a whole, um, I would say, system to cope with the threat of missiles and of aircraft um, on the... Um... Yeah, we lost you. Uh, I would encourage everyone, if you have any more questions following what you already see, saw, um, you know, you can send it to us and we will pass it to Kayla and she will do her best to answer this. And hopefully we will be able to continue uh, in a second. Okay, okay. so I, I'll continue. I, I'll continue a little bit. And I'm so sorry for those uh, technical uh um, uh, technical issues. Um, what I was um, actually saying is that the ability to bomb civilians deep inside the enemy territory was, um, I would say, the, the, the third dimension of war that was added when Air Force um, um, uh, when Air Force uh, abilities were introduced. And Israel had to face this during the 90s and the beginning of the um, uh, first century of the, uh, of the first um decade of the 21st uh, uh, century. Now, the, with the ev evolution of cyberspace, a new dimension of warfare has em emerged, and we've seen it very clearly during the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, war. What is interesting here is that this is not another layer. This is like synergizing uh, warfare dimensions, like leveraging uh, digital space to achieve military um, uh, uh, objectives. So we've seen it very clearly since the beginning of the war with cyber attacks, like regular, I would say, traditional cyber attacks, both on governmental or public institutions, such as Sheba Hospital um, in uh, uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, but we, we also um, uh, saw targeting, let's say, like smart home systems. People started the uh, um, um, uh, people started reporting that the lights in their smart homes started um, turning on and off during the night, which you can actually see, um, uh, understand that this is like a source of instability and uh, and fear. But what's also very, very interesting is the other cyber dimension of the war, which is obviously the, um, uh, the information uh, uh, war. So um, I think, well, I can't really say whether uh, Hamas horrible operation against Israel on uh, October 7th was um, aimed primarily at, um, at the psychological impact or just reflects how terror acts are being conducted in 2023. But what's interesting here is that those are not um, regular or I would say separated fake news uh, pieces of content. This is a coordinated campaign and it is directed by the enemy and it based on narrative for on, of certain narratives for um, uh, viral information uh, uh, spreads and they are disseminated across all the information uh, ecosystem from mainstream media to social platforms to peer-to-peer -to -peer platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram, and also gaming platforms like 
uh, uh, roadblocks. And we all know that the Russians are, I would say, the most sophisticated players here, but I can tell you uh, from my research that the Iranians have also mastered this, uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, playbook. Now, we used to call those, um, I would say, um, we used to, 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 to uh, those, those um, um, uh, acts, um, we used to use the metaphors of, um, um, of psychological warfare or uh, war propaganda. Um, but I think what we see here is another um, planned and targeted dimension of the actual uh, warfare. Um, so I think that the, I would say primary, the primary um, reason for that would be to create individual and collective trauma and um, to harm personal security feelings. Um, but what, what we can see, and, and everyone who watched those horrible, horrible uh, videos uh, of the massacre or um, uh, saw how uh, frightened the Israeli became when WhatsApp rumors as, as started started to spread, saying that someone has been um, uh, videoing or filming uh, their homes uh, in uh, the center of Tel Aviv. You can understand how bad uh, the influence on personal security feelings is. But I think that here the war dimensions have an, an like this other dimension has another purpose which is undermining our ability to discern reality. And this is, I think, an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing, because when we talk about this uh, flood of information, um, it kind of creates um, doubt as to what is genuinely happening. Think about the, the masses of fake horror stories. Some of them were published yesterday. Um, who is responsible and who is to be blamed, which is exactly, I would say, the uh, uh, cracks in the Israeli society at the moment. Who is the attacker and who is the victim? Think about all the campuses in uh, the United States and also who wins and who loses because we haven't got into the end of this war, but, but this is going to be another very important uh, question. And I think that this dimension relies on cultural phenomena that have become prevalent in the last decade, which is post-truth, the fundamental um, distinction between truth and fake, facts and opinions, left and right, private and public, inside and out outside, press and suspicion, you know, all those um, uh, barriers that became very, very, um, uh, very uh, 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 blurred. Um, so... I think that um, what's interesting here is that the addition, um, uh, or when we talk, I, I, I talked before about the aerial bomb bombings that blurred the line between the front and the home front, uh, the digital dimension of the war blurs the line between the blue, which means our forces, and the red, which is the enemy. What I showed you before is actually how interwoven are those uh, types of uh, uh, influence uh, campaigns within, um, I would say, the local Israeli um, uh, uh, discourse. So the enemy's achievements are not made through fake accounts and bots, but through local players that are echoing the, uh, uh, the, the enemy's uh, content, the enemy's narratives, um, and helping them to uh, uh, spread. And this is why it is so challenging to deal with them, because it's not I can put you know, soldiers with guns and, 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 and tell them whoever crosses the border should be shot. This is a, um, uh, a, a mess. When we talk about right-wing activists' Facebook pages and WhatsApp groups that are managed by Iranians' accounts, as I showed you before, or videos and images and posters originating from hostile bodies that are shared by users without, you know, local users without a, sec a second thought. Even when TV journalists echo uh, Russian origins conspiracy theories uh, is also I think we lost Taylor again. Um, she was just answering um, the question about the specific dangers that arise from this new phenomenon. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you again, Taylor. Okay. 
Um, so I, I, as I, as I said, the digital dimension blurs the lines between the reds and the blues, but it also blurs the lines between um, local um, sovereign boundaries because influence op operations are conducted worldwide. It's not only within the borders of Israel, and that's what makes it so so difficult to uh, uh, to cope with them. And here's and here we've got the the crucial issue, I think, because all of this was was not possible without what I call the war intermediaries, which means the social media companies um, that are forming the infrastructure for this additional uh, war um, uh, dimension. Because, you know, we all perceive social media platforms as open and magical and, and, and allowing us um, uh, to have such beautiful, you know, connected world. But now, um, this is actually what allows Hamas to globally distribute our videos alongside false uh, uh, information. And, uh, and even using those third party cooperation, as I said before, local citizens, interest group, criminal or commercial entities um, are all um, actually sitting on this or using this um, uh, infrastructure of social media um, uh, uh, platforms. And here it's, I think it's important to notice that it is not fate. Uh, it is a direct result from a lack of regulatory care of, um, uh, of the distributors. And I thought maybe I would just um, quote here, um, Francis Haugen, who just wrote a book a couple of months ago um, about the trust and safety departments at Facebook, but I don't think it really matters um, in the sense uh, from other social media platforms. She um, there that um, in countries with unique languages, um, the problem is, is are even worse because the social media platforms do not operate AI um, monitoring systems because they don't have the resources to invest in such um, uh, in such uh, uh, um, in such um, uh, technologies, and she has mentioned other countries such as Ethiopia, Burma, Myanmar. But unfortunately, I think we can include Israel um, as well. So, if I yes, just Lina, need to, maybe I can just stop you. There were a few questions regarding what you said now, so maybe we can address those. Okay. Perfect. What we couldn't hear your answer, Sina? Uh, since I can't see the questions, you need to read them to me, Ellie. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, of course. So the first question is more nuanced. Uh, two reporters actually asked how the Iranians know Hebrew so well, and how can they you know they can uh, write in Hebrew, you know, very complex messages to the Israeli um, audience. And the other question is, I think, is more general. Um, you mentioned things that actually, you know, um they have an effect on the on the population in Israel, but is there any examples of things that actually, uh, you know, impact the, the war itself, you know, the battle zones? Okay, so thank you for those two questions. Uh, first of all, about the Iranians, um, it is not a new phenomenon. They've been mastering uh, their Hebrew during the past couple of years. I've been following it since, um, uh, protective uh, edge uh, operation uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think that um, even though they know uh, Hebrew quite well, sometimes we can um, understand very quickly that that is Iranian because they make this um, notable um, Hebrew language mistakes, uh, but not always. Sometimes we really had to delve um, deeper into, uh, for example, the um, time uh, zone where it was sent from, the IP address, and uh, other things. But they're quite um, um, uh, professionals. I'm not sure. Um, uh, also, I'm not sure that uh, everything that um, I showed you is directly from Iran. Some of it, of it can come from Russia. And there, they have um, greater resources. And they're, they've been uh, exercising those um, uh, techniques all over Europe and the United States. Um, in the sense of uh, uh, um, regarding the question of uh, uh, things that have influenced the war uh, uh, directly. Um, so first of all, I think that um, everything that was um, posted online during the massacre day by Hamas uh, uh, terrorists um, had a huge effect on uh, Israeli public opinion. 
um, it had a huge, a huge effect on, um, um, I, I would say, worldwide uh, public opinion. But um, as we can see now, before the war, like the couple of weeks before the war, uh, before the attack began, a lot of fake accounts were um, uh, introduced. Um, um, and and um, uh, ec like eco uh, um, uh, nets um, creating um, the ability to um, make everything uh, go more viral and faster uh, were created in order to amplify um, everything that was posted during the uh, during the attack itself. That's why I said before I'm not sure what was the original purpose of this massacre, whether it was meant originally to create this type of, I would say, digital influence, or this is just the way you do things at 2023. Okay, um, another question you were talking about Iran, Russia, do we know what are the capabilities of Hamas, which isn't, you know, a in, in big international actor? Does it have any capabilities in this field as far as we know? Okay, so, um, I cannot actually say that I think I've seen things coming uh, directly from Hamas uh, activities. What we've seen was more, I would say, Iran uh, sourced. We've seen a little bit of um, activity coming from Yemen, um, uh, from Yemenite accounts. And we've seen a lot of other countries where you have, let's say, bot farms and fake accounts um, because those operation... Uh, um, campaigns usually are based on uh, for-profit um, uh, accounts, not only, I would say, special accounts that were formed for this war specifically. Okay, another question we have from a reporter is, you, you mentioned the blue team, the red team. Um, Israel, is it using any kind of those tools as well when it's facing its enemies? Do we know of examples that Israeli accounts are being used for, you know, dismantling uh, these kind of, of false information? Um, I'm sure Israel does use it, but I have to admit, um, had I been a man, I would say, yes, obviously, that, that, that. I've never researched it thoroughly, but I'm sure Israel is using the same thing. What I am emphasizing here is the lack of Israeli um, abilities and responses to protect its own citizens against this type of information campaigns. This is what I wanted to uh, to say when we talk about the, 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 the chain of failures we've been dealing with uh, during the recent uh, uh, weeks. I think one of the, uh, one of them is that it's, uh, by the experience in the Russia-Ukraine war, Israel did not prepare for warfare in the digital dimension. Um, both in, I would say, creating legal frameworks for, let's say, removing content from uh, social media, such as the Digital Services Act at the EU, uh, but also uh, regular cyber legislation that would allow the Cyber Bureau, for example, to set standards uh, in terms of cyber hygiene and other uh, phishing attacks and, and stuff like that that is happening uh, uh, at the moment. And I think that the reason why we don't this legal framework is because of this complex um, 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 a complex situation where um, you have the, I would say, virtual collusion between the blue um, and the reds. And can the governments of, you know, the world government do anything to pressure the companies to work it out, do the maybe the, the international community as a whole can, uh, you know, try to create a framework of legislation for this issue? So what, what I was saying is that um, usually we treat the uh, international big tech platforms as American companies. Uh, but actually, I think they have become a global order players in the sense that, let's say, Elon Musk, for example, has become, first of all, an amplifier of fake and uh, anti-Semitic. Okay, so what I was saying is that um, I think the fact that um, big tech companies are so deeply involved in enabling this type of warfare, uh, both by the social media platforms and, um, for example, the ability of, um, I would say, civil uh, 
uh, satellites um, um, that would um, allow internet usage and stuff like that, they are becoming a global order uh, players. And in this sense, when we talk about the huge help that America has given Israel in both money and equipment, um, I think um, that by saying that um, the West is going to be next, um, we basically mean that without any global regulations of social media platforms as enablers of what we see of, of this um, cyber dimension of the war, um, we will not be able to uh, win wars like that or to cope with the challenges that wars like that um, actually pose um, this time. And, and I think that local uh, regulation is a very important tool. Israel lacks this um, uh, tool because um, it, does, it did not create any, any digital frameworks or legislative frameworks, but it also, uh, there's also a necessity in creating um, global frameworks for that. So if Europe and America and the US want to strengthen their force um, against, let's say, China and Russia, um, what they would need to do is to create a global framework for regulation of content monitor um, uh, monitoring on social media platforms. Okay, Teila, that was very clear. Thank you again. And we are very glad that you were able to explain everything here despite the challenges. Um, I know we had some time that you stopped on the line and we'll try to, you know, to set maybe a, a wider interview so we can we can speak with you again and you know we can publish that to everyone. Uh, again, if you have any more questions, follow-up question for Tayla, please get in touch with us and we will pass it on to her. She will do her best to answer that answer them. And don't forget our briefing on the effect of the war on people with disabilities at 8 p.m. Israel time today. And thank you everyone for your patience. Have a great day. Thank you.